Hello, welcome everyone to my video series on exploring Islam from a personal um, perspective. Today I'm going to share with you um, something out of topic. I'm just, I thought it'd be a great idea because I get asked about this a lot. Um, and it's all about why did I become Muslim? Why did I choose Islam? What motivated me? What inspired me? What led me to, you know, wanting to give up my previous lifestyle? Uh, I suppose just a, a typical teenage type lifestyle because I converted when I was in my late teens. So I thought I'd share it, the story because, you know, when I think about it today, I, I'm really amazed at, you know, um, the series of events that happened. Um, so let me go back to, first of all, my pre-Muslim days. So as a teenager, I was raised as a Catholic. Um, my mum was Catholic. My dad had a Muslim background, but we were brought up as Catholic. And um, we, we were basically brought up with, you know, important universal values and adhering to that. And, and I had done, you know, somewhat of a, a religious upbringing in terms of understanding the values of, um, of, of um, uh, the Catholic faith and whatnot. As a teenager, though, as most teenagers nowadays, unfortunately, are uh, pretty much, you know, uh, lost in their sense of, you know, coming to terms with understanding the world and their place in it. And for some reason, uh, religion doesn't seem to have a, a, a you know, as, as was the case back then, um, seem to have a role to play in the scheme of things. So me and most of my friends were not um, religious in the sense of, I suppose, um, Aside from having the title of being Catholic, there really I can't really say there was a, there, were, there was ever any discussion about it, or um, in some unique way um, there was a way that um, I suppose we identified ourselves, you know, as strong adherents to religion. In terms of my experience of Islam before being a Muslim, it was zero. So I didn't I hadn't actually ever met a Muslim. I did have a pretty you know negative. Um, uh, uh, idea about Muslims, that's probably because when we did studies of religion in high school, I kind of got the impression that, you know, studying the Crusades and whatnot, that, you know, it, Muslims were sort of brought across as barbaric, you know, um, civilised, you know, war-mongering war -mongering type of people. So anyway, so what happened was after my HSC, I travelled overseas um, with family to a Muslim country for the first time to Saudi actually. Dad was doing some business there and um, it was my first time ever of meeting Muslims. Uh, obviously, you know, because of Dad working there, it was more in a sort of business type context. But um, there was one or two instances where we got to know them on a personal level, socialising and, and pretty much my, you know, impression was, you know, Muslims are from from what I've met, they seem to be really nice people, very hospitable and generous and whatnot. Um, but what actually was the perhaps the, the trigger point on that journey was in the last week of our travels there, and we were in Jeddah most of the time, um, my dad's business colleague mentioned to him how about, you know, because he knew my dad had an early Muslim childhood um, experience. He suggested, what if we go on a trip to Omra, where you can experience um, the pilgrimage? So, um, my dad wasn't particularly religious, but he liked the idea, he, he'd known about it. And um, me not being Muslim, um, you know, my dad's friend, colleague, um, you know, explained what I would need to do in terms of the rituals to be prepared to go there. And I think because I was the sort of person that, you know, I would go by the vibe, so it sounded to me like you know, um, a, a fascinating experience. So I thought, why not? So I went along with, with the family members that I was with. And on the way, so on the journey there, because it was, I think it was about a two hour journey to Mecca, the holy city. Here I was, okay, so I was uh, 17 at the time. So I, you know, being a teenager, I had my headphones on, I was listening to some rap music <laughs> on the way. And then somewhere in between, I heard the, you know, the, the driver, um, he sounded like he was singing. So I was like, you know, I took off my headphones and he wasn't singing, but he was saying something that sounded very melodious. And it really, really, really struck my heart. It really affected because I was someone who absolutely loved music and I loved a variety of music, classical and modern and whatnot. 
So there was something about the sound qualities he was making that really resonated with my soul, with my heart. So I kept my headphones off and I continued listening to him in the car. So that was amazing. When we got there, um, I'll take you to just the key experience that um, really was amazing. When we arrived, he, you know, explained to me that, um, you know, about the prayer and whatnot. And I said to him, "Look, I don't, know. you know, I think he had an, uh, he had thought that I knew some basics about Islam or whatnot." But I said to him, "Look, I don't know how to pray." So he smiled. He was a Sudanese um, uh, man, a really beautiful man with five kids, beautiful family. Uh, he he said to us, well, you know, me and my stepmother, he said to us, just follow what I do from behind and just follow my actions, that's it. And just think about God in your heart. So having been an atheist for many years, I didn't know what that meant because I kind of felt I'd given up on religion. I was a very, you know, someone into social causes and I kind of felt that um, I didn't understand why the world was, you know, the way it was in terms of the poverty and the wars and whatnot. So I reasoned that, you know, the absence of a God um, because of all this happening. Anyway, so coming back to my story, he went, he stood up, you know, a few metres in front of me. We were probably only about two, three metres away from the, the, the car by itself. So I followed his movements and when I got to the part where he went down into complete prostration with the forehead on the ground. Obviously, having never been in that kind of you know position where you totally are annihilated and um, your sense of self has gone out the door, um, and your sense of being has you know is no you know you're, you're you're in that moment where you're like you feel like you know because. <laughs> Growing up, the only time we ever saw people bowing was when there was like, you know, someone of the highest, you know, a royalty or, you know, a master of some kind. And amazingly in that moment, um, something took over in terms of my awareness of, of the reality of God. Perhaps the fact that, you know, having my forehead on the ground, the, the human ego, um, the human sense of self, of who you are, is quiet and so what actually um, came out was um, a very very emotional feeling I, I had tears in my eyes and lo and behold I heard myself saying there is a God you know I felt maybe being in that position of absolute um, you know a servitude you know um, again lowering my head to the same level as my body um, and that's what I actually experienced. And um, yeah, it was a very emotional experience. Um, so that, you know, that being said, I came back to Sydney and, you know, enrolled in uni and, um, and sort of forgot about that, but it obviously it was a very beautiful experience for me. And um, I enrolled in a handful of subjects at uni and um, I, about six months into my degree, I had the opportunity to meet two, Muslims at uh, my age for the first time and get to know them and the first encounter of that was quite amazing because I found that the qualities that I saw in them were very very unique you know a strong sense of being natural being un unpretentious being genuine um, and I really got drawn to those kind of um, uh, uh, qualities as well as a powerful sense of um, generosity and love that I experienced through their friendship. So over time, over the course of that first year, I started researching and became curious about what is Islam. I knew it was my dad's heritage religion, but um, we didn't actually know anything about it. So I started researching and reading books at the library, books about God and Islam, the Prophet in Islam, women in Islam, and um, it just became, you know, an experience of um, opening up my mind to greater reasons why I exist and it made a lot of sense so for example the concept of God in Islam really resonated with me naturally logically rationally emotionally mentally and really was um, 
it gave me such a depth of understanding about who God is and um, and that in itself you know was a powerful life-changing experience learning about God and Islam because it sort of I suppose removed a lot of the obstacles I had in the past in terms of um, uh, um, issues I had with believing in the existence of a God and it went far beyond that and it became easy to feel and, and love God. Obviously with that I then started practicing. I started um, practicing um, slowly, slowly small um, uh, elements of Islamic um, practice, uh, especially in terms of the prayer. Um, I don't think I'd actually, you know, officially decided on being Muslim, but I started practicing the prayer and, and found that I started experiencing a God in an intimate, personal level. And I continued reading and studying and, and you know learning and asking questions and going to different types of Islamic classes. And then I read books about the Prophet, the Prophet Muhammad peace be upon him. And oh my God, uh, I was like, how can a person be like this? Be so sublime, be so esteemed in his ability to love others, to shun those who attacked him verbally and physically and the, the wealth of stories and narrations that are in Islamic literature are immense and um, I, to be honest I've never thought about you know the fact of um, wanting to improve myself in any way I suppose just growing up you just you know you think about your career and and the things that you want to do in your life but the, the idea of improving yourself in terms of the qualities now became something that I felt wow I want to be like this person I want to have that kind of unconditional love and mercy for others, um, patience, um, perseverance, um, amazing faith in self, in God, um, and amazing you know, ways in which he treated others and, and the way in which he lived um, it just was so amazing, you know, in terms of um, epitome of, of, of a perfect human being, I suppose, perfect role model. Uh, his character, you know, just blew me away. And then I read books about women in Islam. I was a bit apprehensive, thinking, okay, this is where I'm going to, you know, hear the bad stuff. But I was really blown away that, you know, 1400 years ago, you know, when the Quran was revealed by Angel Gabriel to the Prophet, peace be upon him, in the Quran, you know, and in his teachings, which were sort of, you know, complementary and inspired by God. Women were given rights that we only had this century, rights to be educated, the right to vote, the right to inherit, the right to um, own your own business. Um, you know, and you know, one of my favorite quotes of the Prophet peace upon him is um, where he says, the best among you, when he was talking to um, you know, a whole group of people, he defined the best man as the man who is best to his wife. So he said, the best among you is the one who is best to his wife. So anyone who thinks that, you know, he was a prophet who taught about um, oppressing women or, you know, in any way undermining the value of a woman, just needs to hear this verse to realise what kind of a person he was, you know, and what kind of a husband he was, and what he taught us in terms of how, um, you know, in the case of men, how to treat their wives, and of course vice versa. So there were many misconceptions that I realised were that I had before which were actually false, fabricated misconceptions. Um, one of them obviously was the hijab, so I wasn't yet ready to wear the scarf. And um, when I sort of, I actually started um, understanding the logic behind it. And, um, and the interesting thing is people think that hijab actually came with Islam, whereas um, hijab was around thousands of years ago before Islam so in the ancient Greek culture for example women who were royal when they would step outside their homes actually covered their faces completely um, because they were considered you know um, uh, that it was unworthy for people to see them because they were of such high status which is interesting uh, and then you had it filtering through in Indian cultures where it was more a mark of modesty and and um, a femininity and um, and a whole range of other things. So, uh, and then you had it in Christianity. I remember my, my, my mum saying when she used to go to church as a kid, you wouldn't step into the church without your hair covered. And I know a lot of Russian Orthodox um, and other sort of um, faiths also have that till today. Um, 
But in that case, um, in the Bible, I think there's reference to it as uh, in relation to where it covering your hair, in relation to um, some kind of subjugation to the man. There's a verse in Paul which talks about it, uh, a woman being the man's property and things like that and covering her hair. Uh, my apologies, I can't give you a reference now, but if you have any questions, I can definitely put it in the comments. I've got it somewhere on my computer. But in any event, with the coming of Islam, there it was basically then... Um, uh, it was a recommendation. So in the Quran, God says there is no compulsion in religion. So God is not compelling anyone to do anything, but He is offering His wisdom and His advice and His guidance, and it's really up to individuals to take that. Um, and that's you know that's the that's you know as clear as night and day. It's it's there. It's in the Quran. So obviously people take that and and interpret it in their own way um, and enforce that upon. Uh, women, which is which is wrong, because the Quran already gives them the right to choose how they want to practice their Islam and how <clears throat> along their journey. So my experience of wearing it was um, quite interesting, quite liberating. Um, aside from the fact of starting to wear sort of longer clothes and whatnot, that in itself actually um, enhanced my. I know this is going to sound maybe weird, but sense of femininity and um, and power. You know, obviously women in the last century have become a, a symbol of sexuality and you see it everywhere um, in, 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 in um, mainstream media and TV and, um, and we've kind of lost the uh, um, awareness of how, um, how I suppose it's affected especially our young people, you know, young people who you know, I know it's a fact of life in some countries where young people are having sexual relations at an early age. They, um, you know, the whole sense of um, uh, values have sort of gone out the window in some respects. So I won't go into that much too much and <laughs> come back to, you know. So I, I really enjoyed the experience of wearing the hijab, the, 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 the scarf, and, um, and I continue till today doing that um, on a personal level. Um, yeah, there's much to say about that. I might actually do a, a video on that and the history of it another time. So I might finish off there. So if you have any questions about my, you know, choice in becoming Muslim, anything that motivated me, um, you know, uh, please feel free to ask me in the comments section. And before I leave, please do subscribe and share this video with friends. And um, we'll see you next time. Okay, bye.